When we think of Falcon 9, we often picture it as the workhorse rocket of SpaceX, frequently tasked with launching satellites, crew, and cargo into low Earth orbit. However, its capabilities extend far beyond that. Recently, Falcon 9 undertook a significant mission delivering payloads to the moon for NASA. How did Falcon 9 get this done, and how has SpaceX advanced with these lunar payloads, and what does this mean for NASA? We're going to get into all that and more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Thanks for watching, and be sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming episodes. Next goal is to get to 150,000 subs. Of course, we're striving to get better in every way, but we still need your support. And again, thanks so much for watching. On any given day, SpaceX might launch a Falcon 9 rocket, roll one out to the pad, or recover one back at port. As of the middle of this month, Falcon 9 has already broken its own record with a single Falcon 9 booster achieving five flights in only nine months. Remarkably, Booster 1067 has now gotten reused 25 times. And SpaceX isn't stopping there. They aim to launch each Falcon 9 booster up to 40 times. Additionally, with its growing expertise in booster reuse, SpaceX has significantly reduced turnaround times between flights. Just in November, the company launched the same Falcon 9 twice in under 14 days, a record for the shortest turnaround yet. SpaceX has done almost 40 missions with booster turnaround around times of one month or less, with all but nine of those recurring in just last year. But there's more to the story. SpaceX is also recovering and reusing payload fairings, the protective shells that encase satellite payloads during their ascent through the atmosphere. Last month, the company confirmed a payload fairing had gotten launched for the 22nd time, setting, yes, another new record. Meanwhile, the factory for SpaceX in Hawthorne, California, continues to make upper stages for every Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy mission. In the past year alone, 135 new upper stages, each costing millions of dollars, have been built, averaging one mission and a new upper stage every 2.7 days. However, these aren't the only highlights as we currently look at the present moment. Just recently, SpaceX's Falcon 9 did two lunar payload launches, paving the way for humanity's long-term goal of getting back to the moon and establishing a new foothold for life there. The mission included the launch of two payloads, lunar landers developed by the U.S.-based Firefly Aerospace and Japan's iSpace. This marks the first time Falcon 9's undertaken such a combined mission. While both Firefly and iSpace had previously announced agreements to launch their lunar landers aboard Falcon 9, industry has Assumptions were that these would happen on separate rockets. This expectation stemmed from iSpace's earlier launch of its lander aboard a dedicated Falcon 9. However, it wasn't until last month that iSpace revealed its resilience lander would share the mission with Firefly's Blue Ghost 1. This dual payload heightened the stakes for SpaceX, not just ensuring customer satisfaction, but also demonstrating reliability to NASA, especially since Falcon 9 experienced a second stage failure last year. Starting out the new year with a record for booster reuse, SpaceX selected Booster 1085 for this moon mission, marking its fifth flight following previous missions including Crew-9, GPS-3, SV-07, Starlink-10-5, and Starlink-677. Approximately eight and a half minutes after liftoff, B-1085 landed on the drone ship just to read the instructions, achieving JRTI's 107th successful landing and marking Falcon 9's 398th overall booster recovery. For the upper stage carrying the payload, Firefly's aerospace separated about 65 minutes after launch following two burns. The upper stage performed a third short burn before deploying iSpace's resilience lander into space approximately 93 minutes after liftoff. Both landers were inserted into Earth transit orbits and following distinct trajectories toward the moon. Updates on their journeys will be given, and if successful, this mission will represent a huge milestone in the future of lunar exploration. Therefore, this mission holds great significance not just for SpaceX's Falcon 9, but also the companies behind the lunar landers, marking a critical step forward in advancing deep lunar exploration. The launch marked the first moon-bound mission for Firefly Aerospace. Its Blue Ghost lunar lander was conceived following the company's selection as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services program. The objective of the CLPS is to get NASA to the surface of the moon without the agency having to build landers or procure launches. NASA has multiple contracts with a variety of CLPS providers, with Astrobotics Peregrine Mission 1 and Intuitive Machines IM-1 flights happening early this year. 
Blue Ghost has a dry mass of 469 kilos and weighs roughly 1,500 kilograms when fueled. It uses a combination of MMH hypergolic propellant and MON3 oxidizer to power the main engine and thrusters throughout the journey. It's designed to carry 10 NASA science payloads to the surface of the moon, which so far is the most manifested on a single lander as part of CLPS. Joel Kearns, deputy admin for NASA's science mission directorate, said that once 10 instruments were small enough that they could fly on just one lander, the agency looked for a company that could execute all the science ops over just two weeks, one lunar daylight period. Firefly and other bidders took up that challenge. They came up with a really credible mission plan to do all the experiments we want on our instruments, Kearns said. In a pre-launch interview, Bridget Oakes, the VP of Engineering over at Firefly, said that the company incorporated learning from previous moon missions. We really took a lot of lessons learned from earlier missions. I mean, we did a full, thorough review of every moon mission that went up, whether it was commercial or NASA. Took a lot of lessons learned from that, and then essentially just kind of fine-tuned and adapted for Firefly's model with the additional product lines, and then took the best of what previous companies had done before us. Firefly also took learnings and hardware from its Alpha rocket and folded those into Blue Ghost 2. There is a lot of great wisdom, experience, and lessons learned at this company. We've got rockets and satellites in our company, so there's a commonality between the two parts of our company and lots of lessons learned that get shared, said Firefly CEO Jason Kim. As we go to Cadence on our Alpha rocket, a lot of those lessons learned, even the reaction control propulsion, that stuff, that's lessons learned for our Blue Ghost lander because we have ACS and RCS thrusters on our Blue Ghost lander that have heritage from the Alpha rocket. So there's a lot of crosstalk within our company. So that really helps programs like Blue Ghost have confidence. As Firefly goes for its first landing attempt set to take place on March 2nd, Kim said one of the key tools on this lander is a quartet of cup-shaped ends on the landing legs. Those landing pads are designed carefully with crumple zones. If you think of a honeycomb and how crunchy it is, it's got that built into the structure, so when it lands, it's going to kind of like your car when you get into an accident. It crumples deliberately. That's what that design entails. The mission, called Ghost Riders in the Sky, will take slightly longer to reach the surface of the moon compared to the last CLPS mission from Houston-based Intuitive Machines. The IM-1 flight took about seven days from liftoff to landing, while Blue Ghost Lander took roughly 45 days. Once on the surface, it'll operate for about two weeks with instruments including a sample collection tool called the Lunar Planet VAC, or LPUV, from Honeybee Robotics, a navigational demo called the Lunar GNSS Receiver Experiment, Lugri from the Italian Space Agency and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and the Regolith Adherence Characterization, RAC, from Aegis Aerospace, which will study how the regolith sticks to a variety of materials. The lander is also designed to survive a few hours at night to capture the sunset and other areas in lunar darkness. Beneath the Blue Ghost lunar lander, inside a specially designed payload canister, was iSpace's lander called Resilience. This was the second time the Japan-based part of the company launched a lander to the moon. Its first launch attempt, Hakuto R Mission 1M1, launched as a dedicated flight on Falcon 9 back in December of 2022 and made a failed landing attempt in April 23. In a pre-launch interview, former NASA astronaut and current CEO of iSpace US, Ron Guerin, said it was a software glitch that prevented the first landing. He said the radar altimeter saw a big jump in altitude as they approached the crater they were aiming for, which caused the lander to misinterpret where it was in the mission profile. It then made what it thought was a soft landing, but was actually about 5,000 meters above the bottom of the crater and hovered there until it ran out of fuel and crashed. We've obviously fixed all that software. We're not landing in the bottom of a deep crater this time, so our confidence level's a lot higher on this one, Garin said. For Hakuto R Mission 2, with a mission name Never Quit the Lunar Quest, the Resilience Lander will target a touchdown in a region called Merfragoris, the Sea of Cold, which lies in the northern part of the moon. The mission will take considerably longer to reach the moon than Firefly's Boo Ghost. While Firefly's lander gets dropped off in a highly elliptical Earth orbit and take just 25 days for a phased orbital approach before performing a translunar injection burn, Resilience takes the slower path to the moon using the upper stage of the Falcon 9 to put on a path for low-energy transfer to the moon. Essentially, it'll do a flyby of the moon, go about a million miles deep into space, and then sync up with the moon again for its landing. What the low energy transfer allows is us to trade fuel for payload capacity margin, Garen explained. It just leads to more capacity for us to get to the moon's surface. The lander carries with it several instruments, including a food production experiment and one designed to demonstrate electrolysis. 
The electrolysis is really exciting because of the implications. If we're able to really do electrolysis on the moon, then we're able to produce rocket fuel on the moon, Garin said. The mission will take a small rover called Tenacity, which will be deployed to operate on its own after landing. It features an HD camera that will be used to capture, among other things, imagery of an art installation called the Moon House, which is a replica of a Swedish home that would be placed on the surface. Garen said the rover comes from the European division of iSpace. The rover itself is really critical to the future of our company, that the rover is efficient and that the data is going to come off the rover is going to be really valuable to us as we continue to hone our design on the surface mobility aspect of the business, Garen said. And so that's really exciting, too. Both the rover and lander will operate on the surface of the moon for about two weeks when the moon slips into its lunar nighttime. Garen said they are looking at a variety of methods for how to potentially achieve this, from orbiting solar concepts to nuclear options and beyond. To start a cislunar economy, you have to be able to survive the night. There's millions and millions and millions of dollars that are being put into these missions, and if they only operate for two weeks, that's not a very good ROI, Garen said. So we want to be able to do surface ops for months or years at a time, and in order to do that, you got to be able to survive the night. And that's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.